Today we have a special guest, Lisa Herzog from the University of Rengen, with whom we will talk about two of her most recent articles, Why Economic Agency Matters and the Epistemic Division of Labor in Markets. We're going to begin with a discussion by delving into some particularly interesting points from both texts. Uh, my question is, if the definition of economic agency uh, that you provide uh, as, and I quote, the agency in acquiring the resources necessarily for uh, the general agency of agents, so to say, uh, would be a sufficient definition um, of agency. And then the question is, if we cannot think of economic agency as an expressive, also as an expressive activity that has value in itself, and not only as uh, not only as the acquisition of resources for general agents. And then the question would be if of redefining uh, economic agency in these terms would mean also would have consequences in the way we should understand an economic domination. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a co-authored text with uh, Rutger Klaassen from the University of Utrecht, um, which we started to develop in 2017 when I was a visiting scholar there. And in a way, what you were just asking about was a bit of a compromise position between us, I guess, because uh, we decided to focus on something that is pretty weak in a sense, pretty minimalistic, and still has critical potential for analyzing economic institutions. So if you just ask me, and I, I, Rutger is more skeptical about this, I would say this, this is really a minimum, but it already shows us so many ways in which economic domination can exist um, that we can already start talking about yeah. changes and so on. Um, I think the, the, the expressive dimension matters to a different extent in different parts of economic activities. When I take out a loan, um, I'm not sure what expressive would really mean. Maybe, you know, there is something about wanting to work with a bank that has certain values um, instead of just a, a capitalist one. I can, so I can imagine possible ways, but it would be a bit of a stretch to say that this is really a sort of deep and important part of my life because it's, it's a transaction really. And as long as we think that these kinds of transactions are necessary, um, um, it's, it's in a way, it's, it's probably more important that people can uh, attain loans without being dominated than to say that they that should then also have the possibility of having some kind of expressive freedom here. Where I would totally agree with you that we need more is the sphere of work because yeah. work is such an important activity. And, and I've, I've, I've written about this in, in different contexts. I would definitely say that we need to also talk about um, a form of autonomy at work and of, yeah, the possibility to sort of co-create meaning together with others. But again, that would be a more demanding standard, um, which then leads to arguments about workplace democracy. Um, and I think the, the, the definition we've used in that paper can serve as a sort of starting point or a springboard for then thinking about further more demanding um, uh, concepts that that's how I would think about that paper and I should also add uh, it took the particular form it got because of the review, review process um, and they, they wanted us to come up with these new definitions and so on um, so it, yeah there was some a bit of compromises necessary to publish it at all as it's sometimes the case. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does, it does, yes. Following on from the previous question, do you think that the instrumental function is more relevant for the analysis of the value of economic agency than its intrinsic function? How exactly do you understand the relationship between both perspectives? Yeah, I guess I partly answered it. I think it's worth distinguishing different kinds of economic transactions there. And maybe as a rough criterion, the extent to which they really have an impact on our capabilities, our daily lives and so on. And then of course the workplace is really quite different from 
other kinds of economic relations. Although, you know, if, if you are in this kind of debt prison that some people fall into because of economic domination on the credit market, then it becomes that kind of dominant force over your life. So it's actually already a, a sort of good situation if you don't have to think about your debt on a daily basis. And it just, you know, it's in the background and every month the bank gets a bit of money back for my house or whatever. That is already a kind of privileged situation um, that you're not being dominated by it. And then you can have a sort of instrumental attitude to it. Um, if it dominates you, then you still wouldn't have some intrinsic relationship to it, but it would have this massive impact on people, people's lives. And before we, we worked on this paper, I had done some work on credit systems in more detail. And when you read some of the practices, payday lending, these kinds of things, it is really, it is obviously domination. It's just a question of how you then capture this. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, as already mentioned in why economic agency matters, you define economic agency as agency in acquiring the resources necessary for general agency. Uh, to avoid the abstract nature of this term, you suggest using the capabilities approach developed by Sen, Nussbaum, and uh, Robbins, according to which you say economic agency is a bundle of internal and external capabilities. Um, according to this approach, capabilities are alternative combinations of functionings where functionings are the various things a person may value doing or being. Nonetheless, at least for Sen and Nussbaum, there doesn't seem to be a distinction between two types of agency because a person's capability set refers there to the alternative functioning combination from which this person can choose or to her real opportunities or simply to her freedom to achieve. So according to this definition of capability, then it doesn't seem necessary to get a specific economic form of agency. So my, my question is whether the use of this metric doesn't weaken your argument in favor of distinguishing these two forms of agency. Um, in any case, assuming that, that this distinction is still necessary, would it not require, and as it might seem also distinguishing between two corresponding types of capabilities. And if this is so, what criteria should be used to do so? Yeah, thank you. So you mean something like economic capabilities and other capabilities? Uh, yeah, and I guess, um, so then again, you need to make a distinction between how you, define different capabilities. And I mean, Nussbaum has this list approach and Sen has a more procedural approach. Um, so one would have to go into these details, but I think for quite a few of the capabilities, if you start from the list, there is actually a clear connection to the economic realm or not. Um, so, um, and, and I guess, um, I'm not quite sure whether it makes a huge difference whether one draws a line there or whether one draws the line at um, sort of a different place in the argument by delineating the economic sphere from other spheres. And on some days, I think it doesn't really make sense to delineate the spheres at all. It's always only a construction. And in the end, uh, for many, I mean, especially now with the lockdown, in everyday life, these spheres do flow into each other. But on a conceptual level, one reason for why I still find it helpful is that when you make arguments about what people should have a right to do and, 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 and what kinds of contractual relations they should have or so, um, you sometimes get a kind of counter argument that says something like, oh, this is just private relations. Let people do whatever they want in their private relations. Um, and the state shouldn't meddle with this. And what I then would want to make as a, as a counter argument is to say, well, no, the, the sphere of the economy is to a large extent regulated by public law, and we need to think about these issues from a question of justice, even though it's not meant, it's not the same as, I don't know, interfering with people's private choices of love partners or something like that. So um, 
I, I want to be able to say that there is this social realm that you describe as the economic system and its rules matter. And in that sense, it's, it's the, I, I'm fully aware that it's an artificial conceptual distinction. Um, but if one wants to ask these kinds of questions, then that makes sense. Um, now, I think the, the, the big question that then arises is the one that uh, Hosta started with, namely, namely um, to what extent should we think about it as really being an instrumental realm, like the, the, the system in Habermas, or to what extent should we think about it as also allowing for other kinds of expressions? Um, and here, especially for work, I would definitely say it needs to be more, but there is this minimum. And, and so we are, in a way, we, we, we're really using capabilities in a, in a different way. I mean, the, the question that Sen and Nussbaum in many of their um, texts address is, is a general distributive question, like what is the currency of justice? And then how can we make sure that all human beings in society um, have access to these capabilities? Um, the question we were trying to address was more, can we use this conceptual toolkit of capabilities to also think about dominating relationships in the economic realm? And I think some of the differences just stem from these different questions that we try to address with these. I, I was just trying to say something about what he said about the delineation. I was thinking about, okay, which of the capabilities on Nussbaum's list would I not put into the economic sphere, but um, I mean, uh, the, the, for example, something like family life that is by definition not the same as the economic sphere, but then the, of course there are always relations because if the economic sphere is structured in a certain way, then this has implications for whether or not or to what extent you can actually live up to your, or you have the, the, the capabilities to lead a family life in a certain way. And so in that sense, I would agree with you that it is really just a conceptual distinction. In the end, it can be very interconnected. And so one probably shouldn't put too much weight on this distinction between economic and other realms. Um, in the end, you want to see the whole bundle. Um, but, so just, just one more reason for why one might want to go for a slightly more sort of segregated approach. I think if one just treats the economic system as a whole, that actually ends up being pretty complicated because it is such a multiplicity of different things. There's credit relations, workplaces, um, financial markets, all these different entities. And to analyze them from a normative perspective, I think one often has to take them sort of step by step. And, and there are people working on what does justice mean for how we run our, cent our monetary system and our central banks. There are people working on reforming workplaces and of course there's always a question of how it all hangs together but I think at the moment this kind of theorizing that really looks at concrete institutional structures is at a stage where we first need these various detailed studies of specific institutions and then there will probably be a time I don't know in 10 years or so when we can have a more integrative perspective bringing these various things together again but because all these institutions have been, or I should say, our thinking about them has been so distorted by one-sided economic models that really have big blind spots. We sort of need to rebuild our understanding of all these different economic phenomena from a integrated philosophical cum economical perspective. And so I think we are just not yet there where we could say, oh, here's a picture of a just economic system. Um, we need to first work step by step. That, at, at least that's that's my reading of the current situation and, and where we are in research. Okay, thank you. I would like to address the question about agency, um, but in relation with the epistemic approach you develop in your paper, the epistemic division of labor in markets. So um, uh, even though it doesn't present, this paper doesn't present a full conceptualization of agency, which uh, you understand closely related to the possibility of acting as morally responsible agents. Uh, I think it assumes some particular conditions for it to appear 
namely uh, uh, to know what one is doing so that one can be accountable or give reasons for one's actions. Um, meanwhile, in your other, the other paper we have um, read, uh, why economic agency matters. You introduced the concept of agency, but uh, linked to economic agency and to a broader concept of autonomous agency um, and two new aspects appear in this conceptualization, uh, competence and authenticity. Um, which relationship would you establish between these two perspectives or how can the epistemic approach um, from the first paper um, I have mentioned um, to have relevant knowledge can be understood from this second perspective about agency. Yeah, thank you. Um, I haven't really thought about the paper is very much in connection, I have to admit, because the other one is was written two years later. They came out sort of at the same time because the one took much longer to get out. Um, and they are sort of written from different perspectives, I guess, because the first is um, looking at people whose economic agency is endangered by domination. And then we use competence and authenticity as these two um, criteria there. And um, you could, if you wanted to, um, fold uh, epistemic dimensions into the competence condition, but it's actually, I think the, the, the sort of similar considerations then apply, uh, like, for example, if you want to buy a house or get a loan for going to university or whatever, you shouldn't have to have a master's in customer's finance. You should be able to access relevant information about available loans and conditions and what's, you know, um, this shouldn't be all on you. The information also needs to be structured in the right way. And in countries with more or less well-regulated economic systems, there are, for example, institutions that compare the conditions from different banks and so you can double check on their website and so on. So it's um, very much an existing epistemic infrastructure that can support individuals' competence. And there are still quite a few deficits there with regard to people from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, for example, linguistic minorities in countries or um, some people just have very little time. and. I mean, there are various proposals for what can be done, and, and one of my colleagues in, in Groningen is also working on how to think about financial literacy in societies that actually require people to be quite financially literate, but don't really offer the opportunities to acquire the literacy. So that was really more that perspective of, okay, how can I prevent being dominated if I'm in a pretty vulnerable position in the economic system? The other paper is more from, if you like, the perspective of wrongdoers, of potential wrongdoers who are relatively privileged as consumers in richer countries and who might be implicated in um, yeah, causal relationships that have to do with all kinds of moral issues. But of course, um, assuming that consumers have a responsibility to take these things into account if they can, um, is a slightly more demanding conception of agency than the one that is about protecting oneself and ensuring the means for one's own life. Um, it's really, it's a conception where there's also a sense of responsibility for others and of not harming others. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's a more demanding conception and, um, I guess I was, I'm not sure I have this in the published version, but in, in some version that I wrote, um, I had a footnote somewhere saying, look, some people might be in a really difficult situation and might not be able, even if they, even if they had knowledge, you know, I don't know, a single mother who lives on, on public benefits and doesn't have a job, we wouldn't demand, morally speaking, from that person that uh, she takes into account all these other considerations, but there are enough consumers out there who can and would actually like to do so. And for them, these epistemic obstacles then are relevant. And so um, again, it, it's really, it's more the, the position of those who would in principle be able to do something, but there are all these epistemic barriers that, that make it much more difficult to achieve better outcomes 
does that answer your question? Um, as I said, I don't have like a, a general theory of agency. <laughs> it was different questions um, that yeah, I exactly. that I addressed in the papers and then came to it from different angles, as it were. Yeah, I, I, I get it. So, yeah. Okay, so we are going now to the second part uh, about collective responsibility and individual rational choice. And my question is about collective responsibility and collective agency. So according to Iris Marion Young's social connection model, the moral responsibility of social injustice is attributed to those individuals who contribute to upholding the social structures within which these injustices occur. This is from the text. Uh, however, when analyzing the persistence of unjust social structures, it might be useful to also pay attention to other kinds of actors. For example, governments and transnational corporations that contribute to the perpetuation of an unjust system because they benefit from it. Now, given that this necessarily affects, although to varying degrees, the agency of individuals, I would like to ask you about your thoughts on collective responsibility. Would we be able to hold actors such as corporations and governments morally accountable? Moreover, given that collective solutions seem to be the best alternative to tackle these threats to our agency, could we say that we as individuals have the moral duty to organize ourselves to resist and denounce those practices? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. And um, on the most abstract level, I think the answer is yes, in some way, we should all do this. Um, and Young is also sort of vague about how much of that responsibility falls on whom. So, so, so here's the way I, I think about this. So we all have certain responsibilities that fall on us pretty immediately because of the, the, the social structures and the institutional structures that we act in, um, certain role responsibilities. For example, in my job, I have certain responsibilities and so on. And in a, in a sort of well-ordered or well society, roughly along the world's and ideas, most, or most morally relevant issues would be addressed by someone. Um, you don't want to have any clearing injustices, whether you don't have any institution that would take care of it. That, that would be the ideal in a way, that whenever something unjust happens, you know, what kind of authority to call, and then they are really competent and engage people who are paid to actually do something about it. That would be perfect. But of course, that's not the case. And not even in like, you know, I don't know, the Scandinavian countries or so where they really have a pretty well-functioning welfare state and so on. This is not quite true. And, and then that means there, there are at least two kinds of questions that follow. One is, um, where do we have responsibilities to go beyond the kind of formal call of duty that is in our work contract. So if, for example, I'm, I work at a university and I'm a woman in philosophy, do I have an additional responsibility to do something against sexism in philosophy just because I'm, an, I'm in a position in which I'm pretty well positioned to do something about that? So connected to my job, um, but going beyond merely fulfilling my work contract. And then the other question, and that's really where your um, question comes in is, where do we have com a complete lack of institutions or institutions that work so badly that it falls back on everyone as citizens to actually do something? Um, so maybe lobby for starting a new organization to take care of certain issues. Um, I mean, if you think about the history of many public organizations, they were often started when you had some problems and then people mobilizing and then over time it got formalized into some kind of official authority like i don't know uh control of food hygiene or th these kinds of things and the, the greatest challenge i think is that at the moment we would need so many of these institutions on a global level really um, because the problems are global and the distribution of responsibilities should be global and then you again have the question at sort of a meta level okay we all have some kind of responsibility to organize but who should do what and who should do how much and i think um i mean one can still say a few things like um, i mean 
young in her model, she has different factors. Like the more powerful you are, the more responsibility you have, or the more connected you are, the more responsibilities you can take. Um, and I would also add that knowledge is one of these capacities. But I think for this question, we get to a point where we really cannot give any sort of principle philosophical answers any longer because we are already in the realm where the institutions are lacking in a very non-ideal state. And then we get to the point where we can just say, okay, it would be good if you did it, but there's no reason to say that you should do it and not you. I think at some point, this is where the theory comes to an end really. And one can just sort of <laughs> hope and pray that there will be some people who will then actually take the initiative. Um, but I guess there is a sort of, how can I put this? There's a sort of dependence on some people doing super erogatory things because there is no sort of clear duty on anyone to initiate such collective organization issues, but someone has to start it. So in that sense, I would say we need a few people who are really doing more than they have a strict duty um, to do. And we, we can be very grateful if they come up in certain areas and, and start these kinds of movements. And then for others, it becomes easier to join and so on. But I think it, it's, it's, yeah, may, maybe I have here some kind of virtue ethical leanings. I, I don't know, but I think there is a way in which we can never fully sort of distribute all the responsibilities of what needs to be done in a way that really nails people down, this is your duty. Um, there will have to be a point where, where some people are simply doing more. If only, I mean, because some other people are just not doing their fair share. And uh, so even if you had a perfect distribution, some people are not going to do what they ought to do. And then some institutions can correct this up to a point, but you will get to the point where yeah, someone needs to uh, do something and we cannot say who the clearest responsibility has. I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer, but that, that's where my thinking at this moment is. Um, may, sometimes when you have a very concrete case, something like, I don't know, human rights issues in the production chain in a company, sometimes you can actually say, well, that person would actually be in the best position to do something. Because you then know so much about, you know, who can do what, who knows what. Uh, also things like who has free energies? You know, if, if person A has a family to, to care for and person B, maybe their children are already grown ups and they have more energy left. These kinds of considerations then come in, but it becomes completely context dependent. I had a question from the perspective of Peru, which is where we are, well, most of us. Um, towards the end of your article on moral economic agency, you mentioned a possible objection to your argument that people could actually opt for the cheapest product, even if they did have access to information regarding conditions of production that were like, deplorable or bad. Might this objection need to be taken even more seriously if you're looking at the problem from countries as poor as Peru? You respond to the objection by pointing out that social norms would change over time if there were a better flow of information. But would they, in a poor country, if the ethical products were even marginally more expensive than the cheapest available option? If this is not a small problem, but one affecting the majority of the population distributed around the world, then what kind of theoretical or geopolitical consequences might this have for your reflections? Yeah, thank you. No, I, I, I totally agree. Um, I should have made this clearer that this is a huge issue in many countries, but it's a sort of self-reinforcing negative circle in so far as people who produce these items then also can't have higher wages because they are producing for very poor people. Um, and in that sense, they are trapped on this low level. And if it's somehow were possible to start injecting more purchasing power at some part in the system, then maybe the wages could rise a bit and then these people would have a bit more. So, so you could get potentially some kind of upward spiral. And I think the responsibility totally falls on the richer countries to get this started. Um, and I mean, I when I was younger, I wanted to work in like international cooperation, all these kinds of projects that try to improve social justice. And I 
yeah, I interned a bit and I got the impression that the whole sector is really in a, in a difficult state in the sense that they don't really get to the roots of the problems and all these well-intended efforts have also become very routinized and there are all these agencies earning money doing these things and it, it, it just um, I had a pretty how can I put this I had the impression that the richer countries are definitely not fulfilling their duties towards the rest of the world by maintaining these kinds of forms of international collaboration and I mean there are lots of really you know hard-working well-meaning people in these structures but the structures themselves have already become so managerialist. I mean, I was in a project once in Morocco and my, my boss, he spent about 50% of his time just with accountability and bookkeeping because the, the project was funded through the EU and the German agency. So he had two uh, uh, donors or yeah, project leaders and he would report to both of them. So he was just all the time writing reports and doing financial accounting and stuff. Um, and I think we have a really uh, there's a lot of work to do and i mean lots of people are working on these issues about rethinking how you could in practice uh fulfill this responsibility in a way that doesn't backfire in a way that really takes people from these countries seriously as partners on eye level not always the sort of downward looking horrible kind of we are coming to save you attitude um and yeah i think there is a role for consumers to at least support those organizations that try to do something here. Mm -hmm. um, my, I mean, this, this is not like something I'm an expert on, but this is just my, my sort of impression. I, I think there are quite a few small initiatives where people know each other. It's very much through personal connections and so on that, that are really doing fantastic work. But as soon as it gets larger and more routinized and so on, often then changes character. And one thing I've often wondered is to what extent it would be possible to improve the flow of information about these well-functioning projects and those who would want to um, really do something and, and help. Um, this, this, I think there, there are lots of ways in which one could improve things here that do have to do with information. And then we are sort of not in, in the, talking about the epistemic infrastructure for markets, but sort of in this whole question of what, what can we do to support global justice, build global solidarity and so on? And, and how can we there find ways of really connecting people so that they can make a positive difference and really find ways of mutually supporting each other? And I mean, so, so I'd be very keen to learn on these things. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering and I'm seeing what doesn't work very well. And um, yeah, you, you might know there is this global effective altruism movement that tries to measure what kinds of interventions have what kinds of effects, but they use a very, yeah, I, uh, their methodology is very much driven by utilitarian um, considerations. And I'm not so sure that all these examples they use really can carry all the weight that they put on it. Like, I don't know, the, the, the mosquito nets are 10 times more efficient than some other form of help. If that worked like this in one country, it doesn't mean that it's the same in a different country. I mean, there's, there's an assumption of measurability and external validity of these experiments that I'm sort of skeptical about. And mm -hmm. But in principle, I think that they are, they want to do the right thing. They've just all studied economics and that has messed them up in their methodologies, I guess. But yeah, if you have, I, I'd be very, really keen to hear from you about this whether you have what your thoughts and ideas about this are thank you maybe we can continue to talk about it in the chat okay now the third section and i'm going to start it again uh, the third part is about access to relevant information lack of epistemic resources ideology and structural poverty and well my question i think you have partially answered it already with another with uh, the answers of another interventions, but I will still read it. And it's as you mentioned in the epistemic division of labor in markets, the access to relevant information other than the price of what we're going to buy is important for us to be able to act as morally responsible agents. However, even if this is a main concern, it seems that granting access to information would not suffice to make consumers morally responsible agents. In the first place, individuals 
do not only need to have information, but also properly understand it. Secondly, and especially nowadays, it is important for consumers to be able to discern reliable information. Without a doubt, this becomes a pressing concern, not only given the number of fake claims that one can easily find on the web. Uh, yeah, but I was thinking also about um, the, the cases in, like Alex has already mentioned Peru. Like here we have sometimes unreliable institutions as well. It's not like one feels that you can freely uh, trust the information you receive. Um, so in the face of this, uh, my question is if, should an institutional design that favors individuals autonomous agency provide these epistemic tools to citizens or would rather be a matter of individual responsibility uh, of the duty to inform ourselves that you mentioned in the article? And um, if social movements in the public sphere would play a particularly important role in this regard, where we perhaps are lacking those structures that would be able to give us uh, reliable information and understandable as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's something I've, I've started to work on more since I did that paper, um, this epidemic division of labor. I mean, hardly any of the pieces of information we have in our lives are really just from our own sense impressions. We rely on others all the time. We're completely dependent on our knowledge, uh, on, on the knowledge of others for our own knowledge. Um, and I think, I mean, I haven't emphasized this so much in this paper because it was on this very basic fact that all this information is missing. But if the information were available, then the groups that would actually make use of it most effectively would not be just individual consumers, but really NGOs, social movements, uh, these kinds of legal advocacy groups that um, try to su support certain cases and so on. I think there would be lots of collective agents that could then do something, run with this information, um, in addition to individual consumers um, trying to change their behavior. Um, and that the, 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 the collective efforts were probably more effective and they would also contribute to something which I think I do mention in, in, in the final version of the paper, that is social norm change, because I, I, we are so much, you know, so much of our behavior is actually shaped by social norms. And if these change, that I think can be very powerful. And I, I think I'm pretty influenced here in my thinking, on the one hand, by recognition theory in general, like. Hegel, Honneth, this, this basic idea that human beings always strive for recognition, but also um, Anthony Kwame Appiah's book on moral revolutions, where he argues that at least some of the moral revolutions we've seen in the past had to do with shifts in what was considered honorable and acceptable in society. And with, to, to, to take the example from the, from the paper, if it became simply sort of stigmatized not to care about the, the sources of one's clothing if you are in a position where you can afford to do so. Um, again, there is a big disclaimer for people who cannot afford it. Then the, the sort of the status struggle that people buy clothes for would also include that dimension. I mean, lots of clothing in the West is not bought because people want to keep warm, but because people want to look nice and show off and belong to certain groups and so on. So it's, it's, a, it's a typical good that people buy because of social norms. Um, and in that sense, if these norms included attention to the moral circumstances of the production, I think this could change. Um, like in, in the 18th century, British housewives boycotted sugar because it came from slave islands. That's, that's the kind of model I'm thinking about. Um, and it, I mean, you, you might say, what difference does it make if one housewife doesn't put sugar into their tea? And of course, well, very little, but if they then talk to, about it to their friends and so on, and it becomes a movement, that, that's the kind of processes that, that I think can ultimately make most of a difference. And then at some point it becomes a law and so on. Um, and, and, but that presupposes the, the informational reliability at the beginning. And you are of course right that reliability is a big issue here and when you have fake news out there and uh, yeah i mean i could say a lot about this to stop me if i'm talking for too long but um let me just focus on one thing here i think um there is really also a role for scientists and researchers and academics here to 
share information about certain issues, to participate in public discourse on issues where usually it's, it's the corporations dominating the discourse. So yesterday I, I was in a, a sort of meeting to, to mentor younger um, female scientists. And there was this girl who said, oh, I'm working on these chemicals and it's actually super well known in scientific circles that this is all very toxic, but it takes 20 years to get any kind of regulation through. And then we started discussing it was, well, of course, because the industry uh, wants to keep these things on the market. And so they don't want the public to know. And I mean, of course, natural labor is a slightly different example, but you know, the big, uh, uh, trading companies they don't want these teenagers who buy all the clothes to think about sweatshops so there is really a role for a kind of counter discourse and I think academics are in a relatively good position because they can get a voice in the media easier than other groups um, to to try to raise awareness of these kinds of things um, and to provide reliable and trustworthy information because I mean th there is a lot of talk about loss of trust on vaccinations and all this stuff. But if you look at international surveys, um, which groups do people trust? Then academics are actually pretty high compared to many other jobs. And so I think there is something to be said for the people who are experts on specific topics to really speak out in public and make these things publicly known. And then all these other processes can hopefully also come in. I, I, I understand one possible answer to the to deal with the lack of epistemic infrastructure uh, in global trading or in a global scale uh, is to raise interest between consumers and having fairer and more moral attached conditions as for example of course in the creation and popularization of labels as you mentioned in the paper um, it appears to be the case that having this information close at hand allows more moral responsible behaviors. Um, I now understand that this proposal is restricted to a public who has the possibility to make these choices. Um, and following this, this, uh, this idea, and if we can only act as moral agents if we have relevant knowledge, how would this approach consider that traditional epistemic obstacles or biases presented by, for example, the concept of ideology? Or uh, if a moral choice become fashionable to buy fair trade products, for instance, wouldn't that elude the problem of what can be considered a moral choice? I mean, the reasons and motivations why someone choose some course of action to buy some product instead of other wouldn't have to do with moral considerations and can hardly be their own. So that's the question. Thank you. No, you're absolutely right. And um, my assumption here is that, well, a couple of assumptions. One is that we are influenced by the social norms and the worldviews of our surroundings. And we all can at moments and with regard to specific issues, step back from these and reflect and think about the relations between different issues and criticize certain views. But quite a lot of our behavior is actually sort of not automatic, that's so strong, but we just follow certain patterns that are common in our society. Um, and even people who think of themselves as pretty responsible, reflexive, maybe philosophical minded people do so with regard to certain issues. And I'm totally including myself here. Um, it's just, you think critically about some areas and in other things you just go along with, yeah, what life around you suggests you could do. Um, but given that picture, um, I much prefer a situation in which the social norms of a society include attention to the moral issues than one where they exclude it. Because at the moment, what we have are social norms that systematically make certain things invisible, really. Um, and in that sense, in the situation I envisage, it's still not like a big moral choice that people are making, they would still follow social norms, but it would have much better outcomes. And 
in a way, I care more about these outcomes than about people making these kinds of conscious moral choices in all they do, because um, I, I just don't expect that we do so all the time. And buying clothes is probably just not the kind of thing that we think about so deeply. And so we, it, I would like to see a situation where certain moral issues are taken on by the institutions and social norms so that individuals don't have to make them a big moral issue at all. So I think about it very much as a sort of question of a division of labor between the institutions including social norms and thereby also, if you like, ideology um, and conscious moral choices. And that, that picture also includes the fact that in a way, ultimately, we are all, also upholding these structures. And at least at certain moments, we also need to make moral choices about this. So I'm not saying that we're always just swimming with the stream or so, but I think we need to acknowledge the fact that very often we do. And so the stream needs to go in the right way as it were. Now, Ideology as um, an epistemic obstacle, I think that is really part of the problem here. And I haven't really discussed it in the paper, mostly because I didn't have <laughs> more space. Um, but I think it's a sort of insidious way in which lack of information and ideology can also reinforce each other. Because if you feel that um, you cannot actually get reliable information, then it feels like oh, it would be completely, it would be very hard work and difficult and I might actually fail in getting a better picture instead of just accepting the dominant ideology on something. So if you don't have good sources of information, individuals might very easily just sort of give up and say, well, yeah, I'm just going to, to go with the mainstream because who am I? I just don't have the possibility to do something else. Whereas if more information gets provided, um, then it also becomes easier to, to question going ideologies. Um, and that of course doesn't mean that they aren't still obstacles because the first step always needs to be to get people to actually ask certain questions. And, and that's what ideologies often block. But I think our, I mean, ideologies are never, as at least the way I think about them, like completely closed systems. They, they always have cracks and tensions and there are inroads for criticism. And that's where the interesting things can happen because then people will start questioning things. So, sorry, this was a long-winded way of saying, on the one hand, I totally acknowledge the challenge, but I also think we can enable people to free themselves more or less from mainstream ideologies. And that is also a matter of the, the, the provision of information and of other institutions. So, so for example, if there is a reliable NGO and I know, oh, I can turn to them if I want to know about a certain issue um, and I can really trust that they, they are in touch with the local people, they are well-informed, it's all properly researched and so on, then I'm in a much better position to question certain mainstream assumptions than if I'm completely on my own. And so in that sense, I think the providing critical counter information, if you like, is, is, a, is a key way in which you can enable people to, to start questioning things. Because otherwise, and that's something that I felt very much when I was sort of a teenager, I always had the sense, ah, there's something wrong with how these things work. But how, where can I go to find out about other sources of information, different viewpoints and so on. Um, and I mean, I, I, I then became a philosopher, so that's whatever. But, um, but I think um, lots of people then stop asking these questions and maybe have them on their own, but then make them a topic of conversation. So ideologies also have this function of particularizing individuals with their critical questions. But if you then have one institution, like one NGO, that thematizes certain issues and brings them to the public, then the different individuals that maybe have some questions about this but haven't dared to utter them can have a point of coordination, can maybe become members of that NGO or whatever or support it. Um, and then you get new epistemic possibilities opening up. So that's roughly the picture I have in mind here. I don't know whether you agree or whether you see it differently or are more pessimistic about critical possibilities? I think I would be a little bit pessimistic, but <laughs> that's maybe because I live here. 
I'd love to learn more about Peru, really. I know very <laughs> little, unfortunately. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> for your answer. Yeah, my question goes more on the so concerns, particularly um, your uh, your argument, your argumentative strategy, and I was wondering if you would agree with with uh, this kind of I don't know if it's an objection, but maybe a, a, a more like a proposal. Um, so just let me read the, the, the question. Uh, so in your critique to Hayek's uh, view on markets, you make two main points. So on the one hand, you argue that markets, and I quote, markets could not be run on some abstract notion of market prices alone. Uh, numerous, numerous other processes for dealing with information are necessary to sustain them. And then you, you continue uh, saying that insofar as markets work well in processing knowledge, uh, they often do so because they uh, because other institutions take on other epistemic tasks. So um, this is this is the first point of your of your critique. On the other hand, you argue, and this is your main point, that the knowledge that is needed for morally responsible agency is often not provided by markets but by other institutions. So to put it shortly. Then, on the one hand, institutions that take on uh, that take on epistemic ta tasks make possible for markets to function well. And on the other hand, if we were to be moral agents in the market, we need some knowledge that market itself cannot provide. I wonder if your epistemic critique of Hayek ru runs the risk of separating too much the ideas the ideas of both criticisms, so missing the opportunity to make a stronger market immanent point, namely that not only knowledge, but moral agency itself represents a necessary condition for the well-functioning of markets. And this is the content of Hales and Durham's criticisms against Adam Smith, according to Honnott. I think this per perspective would make your point about the epistemic requirements of markets even stronger, since according to this view, knowledge would then represent a condition for moral agency, for, moral, for, uh, for the moral agency that is essential to markets, as well as to any other uh, other social institutions, so I wonder what what your what your opinion is about this. Yeah, that 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 goes beyond what I was trying to do in the paper, and um, I guess I would want to ask back what exactly we then mean by moral agency and how demanding that mm. is, because I do think that we need to acknowledge that in, in complex modern societies and probably in all societies, um, not all, not everything we do is, is sort of a deep moral decision. I um, mean, as I said, there's a lot of habitualized behavior um, which can incorporate or, or, and, and, and also be in accordance with certain moral standards, but not because we do it sort of for moral reasons. And so, so, so I guess, there, most economic systems doesn't even depend on this being markets or others need to some extent re to rely on coordinating behavior on that level and not as sort of a deeper form of moral agency. Um, so in that sense, I, I would ask back, okay, how exactly are you thinking about this moral agency in markets? And I think, um, Again, I would then start to distinguish between different kinds of markets and different parts of the economic sphere. And I would make a big distinction between um, workplaces, which are really much more cooperative than markets, which are still, I mean, that's sort of in the definition of markets, um, more atomistic and you just interact from time to time. But then of course, you know, if you interact with someone every week, um, you get to know them, the relationship becomes more than just a market relationship. So, I mean, in that sense, um, in some of these relations, it's much more important that there is moral awareness, that there are social norms that support certain moral standards and so on. So in the workplace, for example, um, it's, it's, it's actually <laughs> sort of a catastrophe if people think that workplaces are kind the kinds of spheres where it's just about self-interest. And that's one of the ways in which management theory has been so harmful by telling people that workplaces are just about self-interest and uh, com being competitive and so on. Um, but I think one then has really to distinguish now, I mean, compared to, to Honnett, 
Um, so sometimes I, I wonder whether he's sort of leaving these more anonymous, less personalized interaction a bit too much out of the picture. It's for him, sometimes I have the impression that he wants everything to be very personalized, very much based on really connections where we know each other and so on. And uh, that may, maybe that's an ideal we could one day reach, but it's very far from where we are at the moment. And I think at the moment, we also need to think about ways in which we can structure these more anonymous, non-personal relations in the economic system better to prevent domination, to pre sort of starting from the low end and to prevent the worst case scenarios that we see in so many real life markets and um, sort of improve structures. And I guess in many respects, that's really then a question of ultimately, I mean, the, the sort of the first best solution would really be legal regulation for many of these things. And then you get into questions about the relation between moral agency and legal rules. So if I do something because it's the law to do it, would you still count this as moral agency or not? And then again, we really have to talk about how exactly to understand moral agency. Maybe you can, I, I don't know whether you want to elaborate and- Yeah, maybe, so maybe because since, since you were asking, um, I, as I, as I am really not an expert on this issue, so I, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid that I will say something stupid, but I, I can still try. Um, I think, for example, that what could still, one could still say against Hayek that um, uh, for a market to properly work, we need to have some moral standing towards each other in the sense, for example, of respecting each other. At least some very very basic moral forms of respect and so on, and in this sense, you could say we could say well, in order for for a, a, a economic agent to be able to respect properly the other members of the economic system, um, he or she needs certain forms of knowledge. You know, and and this yes, that that, that could be the the strategy. I don't know if this is something you, you could consider. That's why I'm asking you. Huh? You are the one who knows better. But uh, yeah, um, sorry. It, it, that's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure how far one can try this argument. So it depends a, a, also a bit on one's view of the state here. And I'm sorry for making this more complicated, but I think one has to bring this in. So when you're saying one needs a sort of modicum of minimum of, of mutual respect or something like that. Like I trade with you instead of killing you or something like that. The question is whether this comes about because we have state structures and the rule of law or whether it has something to do with the market as such. Like it's just, you could say what you just said about, okay, we need a minimum of respect to trade with each other in markets. Maybe we also need a minimum of respect when we just walk around in the streets and encounter other people there. So I wonder to what extent there's something specific about market transaction here, but could maybe try that into a more specific way by saying to trade with each other, we need at least a bit of knowledge about the goods we're trading or the services, whatever, like getting a haircut from someone or whatever it is. Um, and we need to be able and willing to share that knowledge so that we can then have a fair interaction. Um, and then again, the question is, well, to what extent is this something moral? And to what extent is it something that is enforced by law, at least insofar as you have the rule of law um, or some combination? I mean, it, empirically speaking, there, we ha in, in countries in which these laws exist, um, people probably follow them out of a sort of mixture of, yeah, okay, it would be illegal if I didn't do it, but also it wouldn't be quite the right thing. And then, you know, also social norms, people would look at me like I'm doing the wrong thing. And so, so I think often you actually have this kind of mixture of motivations, but ultimately backed up by, by state institutions. And I mean, Hayek, some Hayekians seem to think that the state can be extremely minimal or we may be really just a total night watchman state that we need in order for markets to get off the ground. I'm not so sure this is actually true because um, the legitimacy of state institutions comes from citizens also seeing the state as yeah, doing something for them to a certain extent or you know, it, there being a point in having that kind of political structures. 
And that might actually require far more than the night watchman state in order to enable the kinds of relations between people that can then allow trading as you described it to, to get off the ground. Well, um, now once again, with regard to your notion of morally responsible agency, um, um, uh, could you explain the role that uh, social agents could play in generating knowledge uh, that is not only as having the opportunity to use or to have access to relevant information, but also to produce epistemic resources? I think, for example, in the role that Miranda Fricker gives to the affected, uh, both in the processes of generation of social categories as a form of social criticism, and in overcoming the obstacles that impede their autonomy and self-realization. So very briefly, um, is there a relationship between your approach and this form of understanding epistemic injustice? That's part of the book I'm trying to write, um, but that's much broader. Um, but yes, I, I'm, I mean, I haven't gone into this here again because it's just one paper, but I think, there are really interesting questions about who has which responsibility, but also which right to produce certain forms of knowledge. And I mean, with regard to these economic processes, very often what you see is that people could actually produce and share certain forms of knowledge, but they are forbidden and banned from doing so. Like, for example, all these laws about how employees of firms are not allowed to talk about um, things that they do in their job, not even with their colleagues. I mean. The, the kinds of legal uh, straight jackets that some companies put on their employees. It's just incredible, especially in, in, in US law. They can basically really not allow them to talk about anything with, with anyone. I mean, it's, it's super strict. And in Europe, it's there's probably a bit more worker protection. And I don't know about Peru and other Latin American countries, but I think that is a huge problem and it's, it's, it's both instrumentally problematic because it keeps people from sharing information that would be very useful for people to you know, fight against injustices, but it's also intrinsically unjust. Now, you also talked about um, the knowledge of the affected and that's something where I think there is, there is a sort of deep ambiguity here and I don't see any way of getting out of it, honestly. On the one hand, we need testimony from these people to really get the message across of what is going wrong and what is it like to suffer from these injustices. And yeah, just because they are the most credible ones, it's often most you know, emotionally effective for people to hear directly from those concerned. And they are probably also best able to, to really art articulate what the problems are. So on the one hand, there seems to be a responsibility there. But on the other hand, it seems so unjust to put this additional burden on those who are already burdened by these injustices. Um, and I think there, there is sort of, there, I mean, there's no, no easy way out of that dilemma. But I think what it does mean is that others who are not affected can have duties of solidarity or support to help those who are affected in the generation of knowledge or in the yeah, getting the word out to, to the media or whatever it is in concrete terms to then do something with that knowledge. So, so I think there is, this, it's really this dilemma. We need, we need these people to, to speak and to be heard, but for them, it's often most difficult. And sometimes depending on what it is, there can be issues of trauma and um, yeah, psychological burdens that come with speaking about this. Sometimes also really, you know, dangerous. If, if, if a worker of, I don't know, Shell in Nigeria speaks out about environmental pollution, I mean, people have been killed for these kinds of things. Um, so that there can also be these additional really problematic practices. And again, I may, maybe part of the answer is again, to have organizations that help people like unions, it's often unions that then help to, to, med to, to sort of mediate between those directly affected and the broader audience. But yeah, this, this dilemma of we need them to speak and yet it's unfair. I don't think there's a way out of that, or at least I haven't found one so far. On a more general label, um, how do you think then that the law should protect the production of knowledge uh, in order to avoid the, the problems generated by the private property logic? <laughs> 
in many cases, I would say absolutely yes. I, I mean, that's something I don't really go into too much detail there, but I think in general, the default should be transparency. And I mean, I guess in, a, in my ideal world, there wouldn't be these trans, transnational uh, corporations anyway, but if we had a slightly better world where we still had these powerful international uh, corporations, they would have to apply for any single document that they want to keep secret and get a permission to keep something secret. There are some things where such a permission can probably be granted if it's about employees' privacy or so, but for many, many things, I would just be in favor of radical openness. But openness as such is just a necessary condition and not yet a sufficient one because it means that there's a lot of information out there, but someone needs to actually pick it up, understand it, interpret it, and bring it to people who can then do something about it. Um, so, so, so this discussion has, I, I don't think there has been a discussion like this with regard to corporations, but with regard to governments, there have been some discussions about governments being more transparent and so on. And Honora O'Neill, um, the, the, the British Kant scholar who has done work on this, she has argued very forcefully, and I think these arguments are very good and convincing that just making things transparent really isn't enough. Um, it's, it's the first step, but then you also need mediating institutions that can explain these things to people, condense the information, and point out what is really relevant and in what ways. And that again then leads to this question of responsibility that Alessandra raised earlier, who would actually do it, how would this be organized, who would fund it, but I think that that's what, what we would need in the end. Like unions or um, we say in a Hegelian sense, for example, or social movements. Yeah, no, th those are super important. And th those are the ones who are doing this kind of work at the moment, um, in, in many cases, where it gets done at all. So absolutely, um, unless, I mean, some unions, yeah. I guess, are too much in the cahoots with the corporations and wouldn't want to become whistleblowers. And I, I, I mean, I guess that's another issue. We, we need far better whistleblower protection. I mean, even in countries that have formally speaking good rule of law, um, whistleblowers often end up being treated extremely badly. And I think if we had better protection for whistleblowers, maybe some people would abuse that. But actually, that's a price I'd be totally willing to pay because um, the anticipating effect that someone might become a whistleblower would, I think, have a pretty positive um, effect on people actually obeying the law in many areas if you know that okay someone might actually go to the press about this then you better don't violate certain rules um and the fact that you know oh if someone goes to the press we will destroy them one way or another that that is just destroying accountability and that's i think very very harmful thank you Okay, I have the pleasure of formulating the last question. Again, it's from the perspective of, of Peru. I was hoping I could hear your thoughts about how your work about the morally responsible agency could apply to Peru. Our country might be a challenge to morally responsible agency in several ways. For example, the state is very weak in Peru because of, well, historic corruption and also a tendency to pay lip service only to institutional rules, which can be traced back to colonial times. The state is not playing, has never played, and is difficult to imagine ever playing an epistemic role that would allow for moral economic agency. So would you say that your argument about the problem for economic agency being chiefly at a global level because of the lack of institutional infrastructure on a global scale might in fact apply firstly on a national scale in many countries that are similar to Peru in this sense? And what implications would this have for your argument, especially regarding the, the first best solution about the importance of national institutional infrastructure? Yeah, as I said, I, I unfortunately don't know very much about Peru, so please stop me and interrupt me and correct me if I'm saying something that's just inaccurate. Um, yes. I know, I mean, I guess one, one thing one should acknowledge as at first is to say that, of course, the burdens on individuals when the institutions are not working well can be much higher for doing the right thing in any way. And I think, I mean, in, in moral philosophy, there's this distinction between justifications and excuses, which I find quite useful for thinking about these kinds of situations. So sometimes you may not be justified doing something, 
but there can be an excuse for why we shouldn't blame you if you do it just because the circumstances are such that the price of not doing it would be too high and i think for moral agency in in insufficient institutional settings that this, this is often a good way of conceptualizing what, what's going on um i i can't really speak to the question of you know what would be the best starting point for reform in peru because mm. from what i know very often these different problems are all interrelated um mm -hmm. you have a weak school system then citizens are not very well educated then that makes it easy, uh, more difficult for them to hold public officials accountable that makes it uh, more likely that they are corrupt um they are also not very well paid and that's why they actually need to take bribes so, so it's, it's it's all really interconnected and um some research that i recently found um on high trust and low trust societies has actually really confirmed this intuition that these different factors are intertwined and it turn, i mean th these studies are based on international comparisons and they use survey results on how much people trust others and trust institutions so this is all really rough and mm. you could raise all kinds of methodological questions but the general message is i think in line with what we can observe on a, on a, on a more micro level or in particular cases which is that if you have low trust societies where people don't trust institutions, um, but institutions are also not trustworthy, uh, education is weak and so on, um, criminality is often high and so on, it's very hard to, it's all self-reinforcing. And where when you can take a country like, I think Sweden is, is one of the top countries that they have good public institutions, people trust each other. The welfare state functions well. So, so in a way, it's also very easy for people to be moral agents. Um, it's, it's like it doesn't take a lot to do the right thing because your whole society, at least internally, is set up in a way that just makes it natural to behave in certain ways. Yeah. And I mean, you, you might know this um, discussion about moral luck. Um, and from, this is an older philosophical discussion. And I think it was. Bernard Williams, or in one of these texts, there is an example of two twins who have very similar upbringing, but then one of them lives in a country with good institutions and the other lives in a country with, I think in, in the example, it's, it's like a totalitarian state or something, but you can also take a country with weak institutions. And then they end up, the one being sort of a model citizen and not doing anything evil and the other ah, doing some things that we might criticize um but is this a matter of responsibility or should we think about this as unlucky circumstances and how th do we think about this and I, I mean this has really stuck with me because i think it's, it's yeah there is sometimes this kind of western feeling of oh we are the good ones we are always paying our taxes and, and not doing any crime and it's so smug and awful because it's just overlooking that this is just luck of being born in a certain place where things function reasonably well and in other circumstances it's just so much harder to yeah live up to these things and um yeah I, I I'm not sure I can really say a lot more I mean about the state not playing a strong epistemic role the point that you made last um I guess one thing one can say here but I'm not sure that this helps for Peru in any way is that I don't think all of these epistemic tasks have to be done by state institutions. Okay. I think um, often it can also be other institutions. It needs to be somehow collective. And for mm -hmm. some things, it helps if the state does it because the state can, for example, force all companies to reveal certain information and it has the, the rule of law behind it. But some issues that are about collecting information or coordinating between people, I think other institutions can also do quite a lot. Um, but then the question is, do you have these institutions and can they is it fair to ask them to take on these kinds of tasks um so so i'm not like saying i mean this is something in 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 europe leftist people tend to believe a lot in state institution mm -hmm. uh, and 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 they want it's always the market versus the state but when i have conversations with people from countries where the state doesn't function very well i often realize that one has to be much more flexible in thinking about okay which institutions can actually fulfill which kinds of roles and, and, and states can do so much harm um, 
So there's no sort of one in one match that, you know, if you're a left wing person, you need to be pro state. Uh, that's much more context dependent. And uh, even in Europe, I mean, it's so far from, there's so much that goes wrong here as well. But yeah. I mean, I don't know, yes, well, you have conf confirmed this, but at least in Northern Europe, the left wing people are all pro state and against markets instead of differentiating a bit more. Yeah, well, I was wondering if I could throw in a, a, a re-question, a reflection, um, we have time uh, a little bit on the basis of what we're talking about. Um, I think that when thinking about your work from the Peruvian perspective, I, I am also led in the direction that you mentioned towards the end. Okay, so perhaps the state is not the way to kind of ensure this, uh, this moral agency. What role can other um, institutions, initiatives, collective initiatives play. Um, and I wonder if that role would be directly an epistemic role. And that's, I guess it's a kind of very profound question. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously exploring waters in which I'm not an expert. Um, but I wonder about, you mentioned just now about how um, certain things are made natural, right? Certain ways of acting are made natural. And I understand that the, the premise is that if certain information or knowledges are made available, therefore certain ways of acting would not would be like denaturalized. Um, I, I am a, 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 I, I study literature and cultural production. So I'm thinking about it from this angle and I wonder what kind of role cultural initiatives, artistic forms, and um, you know the different ways in which societies have a cultural life can also have a role in denaturalizing these forms of acting which aren't necessarily about mediating information but could make people perhaps more receptive to information and i don't want to exaggerate the kind of hope that you know art will save us i'm very skeptical of that of that view generally um, but, you know, when thinking about it, you know, from a third world country and at the brink of a national election between two very bad options, I, I search, I kind of, yeah, I further around for alternatives. I totally agree. Um, and also, again, if you take the historic, historical examples, um, I mean, today, Uncle Tom's hut is seen as problematic for various reasons, but historically it did play a really important role. So I think, especially the kind of art that provides a first person perspective of certain positions in society that we would otherwise not have access to and does so in a way that really allows a kind of empathetic connection. I think that can play a huge role um, in really, as you said, destabilizing people's belief systems and then maybe make them search for more information because they've realized that, okay, maybe there is something I should try to find out more about. So, um, I do think that art has an important role. What I've come to think about more in recent years, um, and I have never sort of theorized about this, but I think satire and comedy are also hugely important. Um, like making fun of the powerful can be really an important part of the mm -hmm. I don't know whether this is something in your, in your country, but. Um, Actually, in the US, the most reliable evening news and the most critical reporting is, is in, in, in comedian shows. Uh, it just says something about the media system as a whole. Mm -hmm. But even if you have a relatively well-functioning media system, I think um, there is really a sort of critical, yeah, like uh, in, in, in medieval societies, you had the jester at the court that made fun of the powerful. And I think, um, there is something about that, and if it gets public, um, and I, I mean, if you had more of that, maybe some of the powerful people in society would feel more like they have to, uh, yeah, not do certain things. Um, although, I mean, <laughs> now no, I'm totally talking out of my, yeah, what I've published so far and so on, but um, one of the problems that I see in so many social systems, but especially also in the economy and these big international firms is that, the people who make it to the top are the ones who have such thick skins they mm. cannot be bothered about anything i mean except for like really sending them to jail and publicly humiliating them maybe maybe to some extent but the internal selection mechanism is such that 
to put it very briefly, the moral agents are being sorted out before they could rise to the top because you have mm -hmm. to be so ruthless um, mm -hmm. and willing to backstep others and so on. I mean, this is a, this is a bit of a caricature, but especially in combination with the kinds of economic doctrines, the kinds of management literature that we had in the last decades, um, there is something deeply, deeply, deeply going wrong on that level, the internal selection mechanism of who makes it to the top. And there's all this talk about leadership and so on. And I mean, a lot of it is just bullshit, really. It's horrible. And <laughs> bullshit as such, maybe we could not care, but it's selecting systematically the wrong people to the top of organizations. And often they are both incompetent and they have no moral conscience. And Sounds then like organizations say. become, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so, sorry for gossiping here, uh, ranting, but <laughs> it's, I, I want to write about this at some point, about selection mechanisms of how do parties, even social movements, I don't know whether they always select the best people for the top, maybe better than others, but companies are just horrible and political parties, yeah, so, so I guess. Okay, well, we're looking forward for your next publication on, the, on this issue. <laughs> well, we have now reached uh, the end of the conversation. So thank you all very much for the discussion. And thank you very much, Lisa, again, for accepting. Well, thank you, to you for, for great questions and great discussions.